I am happy to uh, welcome Phil Worthman and Lee Rarman. 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 Rare man. Rare man. Rare man. Rare man. Rare man. Worth man or rare man? Worth man and rare man. <laughs> Just a lot of man. <laughs> so join me in this awesome, this awesome session on uh, male reproductive hormones, particularly testosterone and fertility. And I want to thank the Center for Me Male Reproductive Medicine and Vasectomy Universal for joining us and supporting this conversation. Um, it's a very important topic, and so I'm really, I'm really glad that they're sponsoring us. Um, I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for joining us, and also the, uh, the virtual audience who's on Twitter. You can continue the conversation at hashtag FPLA14, uh, and we'd love to hear your comments and feedback there. Um, so I'd like to start with just introducing and, and hearing a little bit from each of our panelists about themselves. So we'll start with you, Lee Rehrman. Uh, you can give us a little bit about who you are and, and your interesting well, topic. Okay. Uh, my name is Lee Raman. I am a, uh, an actor and a producer. I'm an entertainment guy. Uh, I went to uh, Cornell undergrad where I played football, and then I went and played for the Dolphins for about a minute. And then I came out here uh, after I went to grad school here at UCLA Business School in Anderson. Uh, and then I, my first job in entertainment was as an American gladiator, of all things. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess that kind of just rolls right into why I'm here. Uh, coming up as a, as a gladiator and an entertainment fitness guy, um, I, I did not take steroids, but I trained really hard and did all the kind of those kinds of things and took lots of supplements and all that kind of stuff. But I came across many of the individuals, uh, my teammates as gladiators, a lot of fitness people over the years who just abused the heck out of steroids. And one of the reasons why Dr. Phil asked me to come here today was to tell you, um, you know, a little bit about my experience with the allure of, of, of too much testosterone. He's going to get into this more of the, st uh, the statistics about how prevalent it is, but um, number one is, you know, a lot of times you'll hear about um, the, 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 the claim is that, you know, steroids are not proven and testosterone is not proven to, to help as, as a sports enhancing drug. That's, that's crazy. If you, if you don't think that you get bigger, stronger, faster by taking steroids, then your, your head is up your rear end because you do. And quickly. And it's, it's, the allure of that is incredibly strong. I, I have one particular story I remember. My first year of the American Gladiators, I was kind of like the, the new guy on the block. And we came to our first production meeting, and they came in and they said that the network was going to start testing us for steroids. And some of my teammates, who I'm not going to name names, you would have thought that they were asking them for their firstborn and or a kidney. I mean, it was just crazy that, that these guys thought that this was going to be taken away from them. Then uh, throughout the, the subsequent meeting, uh, it, was, it was discussed on what the testing was going to consist of. And you're going to be tested twice. You knew what you were going to be tested the first time. You knew what you were going to be tested the second time. And they said if you showed an increase, you didn't pass the test. If you showed a decrease, you did pass the test. So lo and behold, all my teammates went out, or some of them went out, and just totally amped up the testosterone. And then when, they, when the test was coming for the second time, when they knew it was coming, they decreased it, so they passed the test. But the, the, the allure of it is just incredible. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem when you, you know, at the, at the gyms that I work at at now, see these kids come in one week. You know, they're a 150-pound young kid, and then two, two months, well, it's even less than that, sometimes, you know, four to eight weeks later, they're 245 pounds. It's just crazy. So the, the allure is there, and if, 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 if you don't think that the, 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 the quest to get bigger, stronger, faster by these folks is, is going to be a problem forever, then I think you're all right, let's, let's uh, have uh, Dr. Worthman introduce himself. You can tell us a little bit about your practice and, and, and what interests you in, in this topic. So my name is uh, Dr. Philip Worthman. I'm a male reproductive specialist. I've been practicing here in L.A. for over 20 years. Um, and I specialize essentially just in taking care of male reproductive problems. The reason that I thought this is such an important topic is because testosterone is being used in almost epidemic proportions. And it hurts fertility. Testosterone, for someone who has a low testosterone, is a very good thing to replace. But uh, it's being done in what seems like a very inappropriate uh, fashion. And what most people don't know, doctors included, is that testosterone will actually sterilize men, uh, mostly temporarily. But in some men, it actually becomes a permanent issue. So the message that I want to uh, get out there is that men need to be very careful. And as men become older fathers in their 40s and in their 50s when their testosterone is lower, 
that they need to be careful when they go to their internist and they put them on uh, testosterone, which sometimes uh, isn't really even considered a medication by them uh, because it could be a cream or a gel or an underarm roll-on type uh, application. And when you question men about it, they sometimes forget they're even on it, that it is a medication. Right, right. So maybe what we can do to start off is, is let's just kind of lay the framework of, of male reproductive hormones and testosterone is part of that. Maybe you can explain how do they contribute, how, do, how does sperm production happen, and how, why does testosterone even matter? Sure, that's a great question. So you have to have a, a, a working knowledge of uh, endocrinology and how the brain and the testicle and the body interact. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary, the master glands in the brain, make uh, certain hormones. Uh, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the pituitary to make luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Those uh, hormones are picked up by cells in the testicle, and those cells will then either uh, produce testosterone or make sperm. And this then works on a negative feedback system. Testosterone gets into the bloodstream. It's picked up by cells in the brain, and it has an inhibitory effect, meaning that if your testosterone is normal and there's a lot of the chemical around, the brain says, hey, I don't have to make more testosterone, so the hormones in the brain get lower. And this then works on, on a cycle, almost like a thermostat. So when those hormones get lower, testosterone output gets lower, and then the brain kicks back on, and then there's stimulation for testosterone. And uh, it goes round and around in a rhythm. The problem when somebody takes testosterone from the outside world is the brain doesn't know where the testosterone comes from. It just knows that it's around, the receptors get saturated, and then the brain doesn't turn on. So there's no stimulation by LH and FSH, so the testicle then doesn't have to make its own testosterone. And as a byproduct, it stops making sperm. Mm -hmm. so, so there really is, men really do have two, two brains. They have the brain <laughs> up top and the brain down below who's sending the message to the upper brain. And one in between. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. A little head talking to the big head. A little head talking to the big head. <laughs> Usually I get punched when I say that. <laughs> Not in this session. The big head stops the, Never mind. I was going to ask which is which. Yeah, which is which. I think in some, in some men, they're, you couldn't tell. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the world of athletes because most of us do not get a good peek into what this world looks like. And so we, you know, we have some knowledge just from reading news reports about you know, testosterone is being used or steroids are being used. Like, are there tons of different types? Are there, and, and is this very common? Is it, is it well shared? Uh, is it very secretive? Is it underground society? I don't know anything about it. I think it used to be when, when I was first coming up through athletics and then again doing the American Gladiators, I think it was a little bit more of like a and, and kind of an undercurrent and the underbelly was kind of kept under wraps. But nowadays, uh, and I, I think to some extent it's a good thing, that, and we were talking earlier about it's good that, that men are, or that society is finally, you know, women's fertility issues rightly have always been uh, of concern. But now, the last, I think, decade or so, or at least the last five, four or five years, uh, low testosterone is starting to get its, its due, and, and people are starting to recognize that there are some problems for men and men's fertility, but uh, with that has come, I think it's become less and less a, a, a dark thing that people don't talk about. So, uh, in, in my opinion, again, I, I, I can't speak specifically about the individual drugs that are out there on the market, but I think that it's become much more of an accepted thing for men to take testosterone. Um, whether it's prescribed by a physician or not, and sometimes even when it's prescribed by a physician, it might be abused. But I do think that the abuse of steroids has gotten a lot more, more prevalent. Do you think that, this is for either of you, do you think steroid use or, or testosterone use is increasing because um, there's more pressure to be uh, athletically performing, or do you think it's, it's more the allure to, to older men to feel vibrant, younger, longer, uh, healthier, stronger, is it equal? What do you, what do you I think it's both. I think that for professional athletes, you are in a world of, of extreme competitiveness. And you have to keep up, and this is how you're going to make your living. So anything that gives someone a competitive edge uh, clearly has significant value in the world that Lee comes from. In the world that I live in, it's more an issue of as men get older, they want to feel younger. They want to feel better. They want to have energy. They want to be able to focus on work. 
they want to be able to complete tasks, they want to enjoy sex. Um, all these things uh, are, are fueled by testosterone. And as men get older, it's part of nature, their, uh, test uh, their testicular testosterone production drops. Uh, and uh, they want to replete this and, and feel better. So I think you have two, two distinct groups of people who are using this for uh, similar reasons, which is to perform better. Mm -hmm. and what I was just going to add to that is, you know, one of the problems, though, obviously, and I don't think we've talked yet about the, the, the downside necessarily, is, you know, a lot of these guys that I knew coming up through the entertainment business and the, and the world of, like, sports, sports entertainment uh, and, and fitness, I mean, these guys, a lot of them are having real problems now. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we all know, like, the anecdotal stuff, you lose hair and everything shrivels up and your parts don't work, but... It's even broader than that. I mean, a lot of these guys have kidney problems. They have, I know some of these power lifter types that I've done some fitness shows with. Uh, I, I know a couple of guys, not real, real well, none of my close friends, but I know a couple of guys who are deceased now just from having abused these things for years. And, uh, and then there's also the, the, the added, um, I guess, problem with these guys are so aggressive and they do things. I mean, a lot of these guys, you know, when, they, when they're on these drugs, they commit crimes, they go out, they beat people up, they beat up their wife, they beat up their... Their friends, they beat up anybody, they beat up buildings, they beat up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's just, you know, there's, there's a, there's a. So roid rage, I think. The roid rage downside to this stuff is, uh, is, is just quite, quite an epidemic. And when you're a younger kid, too, especially because you're, you're susceptible and your inhibitions are, are low because you're younger, you know, this is just a bad combination, bad recipe. Right. Do, do you guys go into it? Do they have any awareness of what all these risks are, these effects? Of and you're young. You don't care. What do you care? You're, 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 your horizon is Saturday night. And you want to get big? And, then you well, and, if, get and if you're an athlete and you're, you know, you, you train and you train hard and, and, you know, like fortunately for me, I've always kind of, because of my, my, I've been in the fitness game and I've been in entertainment. I've always worked out, so I've never, I've never stopped exercising. So it hasn't been a yo-yo effect. So even though I'm older now, I'm 48 years old, um, my 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 physical performance hasn't started to come down yet necessarily because I've never. It's kind of now the, the rate of increase is kind of like plateaued. I mean, I'm not getting any stronger, but my my body is 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 still kind of like. I'm hanging in there. You so look straight. amazing. So, oh, you know. <laughs> so you, but some of these young kids, when they're, you know, when you're 16, 17 years old and you're a, a high school football player or you're a high school um, a baseball player and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're competing for a job as an offensive lineman or as a linebacker and you're 140 pounds and over the course of a summer you can go from 140 to 210 and, and just be destroying people. That's, 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 a, that's a, a, a powerful allure to a young kid who's trying to, you know, not not even not even get the attention of coaches, but just get the attention of his peers and everyone else. So, how do guys get big without without juicing? Oh gosh! I mean, you're big. Twenty years of working your <laughs> rear end off. Um, it's just it's hard work, you know. And then any and just like anything, if, if there's if there's a quick fix, people are going to gravitate toward it. Mm -hmm. And it's just there's just no quick fix. So, so before you get to that, I want to talk about uh, the question you asked, which was, do people know about the side effects? Uh -huh. And the answer is that they really don't. And, and this is part of the awareness that I want to create because many, many physicians are getting into the anti-aging game and uh, internists are now taking care of, of, of men's hormone replacement and as medicine is expanding and people are always looking to, to uh, broaden their practices, I think a lot of doctors don't understand basic endocrinology and don't understand the side effects of these medications. Uh, and that really, really, really is a problem. When you look uh, on, on TV and you see these commercials late night, and, and really a whole industry has be, been created uh, around you think how much money it costs to put a, a commercial on TV and replay it over and over every night, that's how much money they're making times 100. Yeah. And you can hear some of the side effects in the commercial, but they rarely, if ever, really talk about sterility. They say, may lower your sperm count. Well, when you hear that is as one of 15,000 things that they're listing, it doesn't really, right. you, you really know. Right, I think you have millions and millions of strong sure. strong. What, 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 right? what does may lower your sperm count mean? May lower your sperm count, just a little, just a little. Just a little. I can, I can few, knock off yeah. a few little guys. Um, or if you have an erection for longer than four hours, call your physician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling. I'm calling the newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> What's the problem? There's no problem. Send over a crew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling the doctor. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> so this, this, 
does the testosterone <laughs> cause permanent? Does it, is it permanent damage? Like, is it destroying the testicle? So or is it just knocking things down? In most men, the answer is it's probably not permanent. But it also depends on what underlying condition you have, how long you're taking it, how much you're taking. In some men, maybe 5 to 10% of the time, some of the damage can be permanent. Mm -hmm. And I, I've encountered that with patients where we couldn't uh, re-stimulate the testicle to start producing sperm, and they were, they were sterilized. So, so what do you do? So guys come to you, and, and either, for, uh, either they're aware, and they say, I want to perform, and I'm worried about my fertility, or they're older, and uh, they, need, they, they have relatively have low, low, low T, and they really need to get a boost, and they have something going on. What, what do you do or recommend to help that? So the first thing is, is I want to find out if there's a, a cause for the testosterone other than just striking it up to age because some men aren't that old. They're in their 30s and early 40s. So we want to look for a cause, uh, ruling out any kind of pituitary issues, pituitary tumor, ruling any problem with testicles such as varicocele. But there, there are two distinct groups of people that sometimes overlap. So those who come in who have already been put on testosterone are infertile. They're treated one way those who don't care about fertility and have low testosterone, and we treat those men with testosterone. And mind you, I want to repeat, testosterone replacement therapy isn't a bad thing in and of itself, as long as someone's informed of the risks, the side effects, uh, you know, then you have to make a, a cost-benefit analysis. Right. If it makes you feel better and the, the side effects are, are, are low, and uh, you're given these medications under the care of a, uh, of a physician, then no problem. Um, the third group of patients are those patients who have low testosterone and have effects, uh, but also want fertility. Right. So there are other medications that we can use, such as uh, Clomid or uh, HCG, which is the same medicine or the same chemical as the brain makes, the LH, it's the analog. So we stimulate the testicle. So the testicle does the job by itself without taking testosterone from the outside world and shutting down sperm production. It's interesting. So you can actually use Clomid with men. That's just the, mm -hmm. You know, as women here, we, a lot of us understand that as a, as a, female, a female helper. And, and yet you're saying you can use it to help boost testosterone. So in some men with the right hormone profile, Clomid will actually boost their testosterone and make them feel better. In men who are on testosterone who need to come off of fertility, Clomid can kickstart their system such that sperm production comes back faster. Wow, and, and how long does it take for sperm to, to react to these kind of alternate? In theory, it takes 72 to 90 days to make a sperm, so you would say three to six months, but I've seen men uh, that have been put on Clomid, and within a month they have the return of sperm to their ejaculate. Wow. Not normal, but it slowly so starts coming they're, back. they're starting to come back. Because some men aren't suppressed completely uh, by right. the testosterone. Right. Um, how about how about natural methods? So you you're talking to a guy and he wants to stay healthy, he wants to be vital, he wants to be vi vibrant, doesn't want to go on medication, doesn't have any surgical issues. Are there things that men can do to really maximize testosterone as naturally? Absolutely. And uh, our, our other guest, uh, Harley Pasternak, who is a uh, exercise physiologist, unfortunately had to fly out and couldn't be here, but he was kind enough to record a video to discuss just that issue. So if we want to go to the video, then we can uh, hear him speak about that. That would be great. Hi, um, my name is Harley Pasternak, and uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you there today. I am in a hotel room somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, believe me, I'd much rather be in Los Angeles. My job and my career have um, given me a really interesting um, background to be able to talk about uh, testosterone, testosterone levels, um, and their implications on wellness, well-being, um, and, uh, and aesthetic. My um, undergraduate degree is in exercise physiology. I then did a master's degree in exercise physiology, a degree in nutrition, a master's degree in nutrition, and I was an exercise and nutrition scientist for the Department of National Defense for several years where I led up the superhuman lab where we looked at different foods and drugs to help soldiers uh, run faster, jump higher, stay awake longer. And it was a very interesting period of my life. Um, at that time, I started a personal training business that catered to actors that would come to Canada to shoot feature films. And we worked on some pretty bad films. Um, uh, business expanded from Toronto to Montreal to Vancouver and in the past 23 years I've worked with everyone from Spider-Man to Catwoman to Green Hornet 
to Jesus and the Passion, to Moses and the Ten Commandments, to the Green Hornet, the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, and everyone in between. And it's been an amazing ride. Um, most of the work I do is really getting people to look their best, and hopefully they feel their best along the way. But it's really about creating the aesthetic and shaping, toning, sculpting um, lean muscle tissue. Obviously, testosterone is an essential component to uh, both women and, of course, to men to be able to make them look their leanest and their fittest. Um, the effect of testosterone on uh, muscle growth and lean muscle tissue is well established. And there are many different ways that we can, uh, we can increase um, the amount of testosterone we have in our body. I mean, first of all, losing weight has been well established uh, that uh, the lighter we are or the heavier we are, sometimes we have a drop in testosterone and a boost in estrogen. Um, high intensity exercise, high intensity cardio, uh, so sprinting uh, in short bursts of cardio as opposed to long uh, endurance activities. Marathoners, for example, have a suppressed testosterone level in many studies, uh, whereas sprinters have a higher one. Uh, making sure you're not deficient in things like uh, zinc and vitamin D, both of those have been shown to drop your testosterone levels if you're deficient in them. Strength training has been very long and well established uh, as a really effective way to increase your, um, your testosterone levels. Uh, certainly reducing stress, the stress hormone cortisol, we know has a profound impact on your testosterone levels. Um, cutting back on sugar, high sugar has also been shown to impact uh, our testosterone levels and certainly eating healthy fats, uh, omega-3, omega-6, all of our essential fatty acids. Um, those have long been um, touted to, uh, to increase all of our hormones that we need to help us look great and feel great, and of course, testosterone being one of them. Um, pulling up my other question. Um, I actually uh, have an interesting history um, with my testosterone levels. I was feeling very, very tired for a period of time and um, consulted uh, with Dr. Worthman um, about my fatigue and had some actual some testicle pain, uh, which was the main reason that I, uh, I went to meet with him. And um, he mentioned I had a varicocele and that uh, it's not a big deal, it's very, very common, and so long as it's not significantly impacting my quality of life and there's no other serious health issues associated with it, you could theoretically live your whole life and, and be fine. Um, and then he asked, you know, how are you feeling? I said, I'm really, really tired. I just, I feel exhausted lately. I've been skipping workouts. And so he said, okay, well, let's check your testosterone levels while we're at it. Check my blood and uh, called me the next day and said, um, you must be tired. My testosterone levels were incredibly low. And, um, and he talked about the options and uh, one of them would be to go on testosterone therapy and um, one of them would be to get a varicocele repair. Um, he sent me for uh, an ultrasound, which uh, verified I did have not only one varicocele, but it was a bilateral varicocele. And um, we know that having a varicocele um, has been shown to definitely impact your testosterone level. Um, and having varicocele repair, repair has been shown to dramatically repair that and increase your, your uh, endogenous uh, testosterone production. So for me, it was a, it was a no brainer. Um, I prefer to get something fixed rather than uh, take medication the rest of my life. And of course, there's side effects associated with uh, testosterone therapy. Um, I immediately booked the surgery and uh, Dr. Worthman did uh, the surgery. It was, was in in the morning and at home a few hours later, completely drugged out of my mind, but home nonetheless. And uh, missed a few days of work. It was painful, I will tell you that. But um, the truth is the surgery itself wasn't that bad. It was the, the painkillers uh, and um, it was the painkillers and uh, the it, not being able to move that causes constipation that caused a lot of the pain. So um, he had the surgery and uh, within a week I went back for a checkup and he checked my testosterone levels and they already had gone through the roof. Um, it was incredible. I actually started to feel significantly better um, within two or three days of the surgery, better than I was pre-surgery, uh, even though I wasn't that mobile. Um, 
I didn't have any sexual dysfunction prior to the surgery. A lot of people do. I didn't, uh, but I certainly wasn't as interested in sex maybe as I, I was in the past. Um, but certainly after my surgery, I, it definitely increased my sex drive, my libido, uh, my energy, my stamina, my strength. Um, and ever since then, I haven't looked back. So it was definitely a decision that I, I feel really glad that, um, that I did. Um, uh, what else can I say about testosterone? We need it. It's essential. Um, you can survive with low testosterone levels, but I do think it's, it's difficult to thrive with low testosterone levels. And um, as a male who not only wants to be healthy, but wants to be very functional, you know, there's, there's studies showing that some people with slightly lower testosterone levels actually live longer. Um, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be shortening my life now that I've repaired my body's production of testosterone. I definitely have increased the quality of it, and I feel great. And um, yeah, so thank you very, very much, Dr. Workman. And thank you for everybody there for uh, putting up with uh, my funny angle video. And uh, if you have any questions, you can direct them to Dr. Worthman, and he'll direct them to me when I'm back. Um, and I miss California. Thank you very much. So that is so touching. He, um, you know, you hear about varicose yields. They're common. There's like, what, 15% of men or something? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, have varicose yields. And we, we do, a lot of times when we're doing a male fertility, you know, e even a, a, ge a general urologist who's not so into the, the testosterone understanding fertility thing will go, oh, well, there's a varicose yield. We have a fertility issue. Um, but interesting, I didn't know that it, it could also impact your testosterone levels uh, so, significantly. Yeah, the, the testicle essentially does two things. It makes sperm and it makes testosterone, and a varicocele can impact both. Wow. One or the other or neither. So I guess this would go into a decision as a, you know, if you're a, if you're a couple and you're dealing with, um, you're starting to go into this, what's going on with us, and you find out you have a, a male issue, you might have a varicocele, it, it, it's, a, it's a point of consideration that not only is it going to help to restore fertility sometimes to get things corrected, but it can also improve quality of life. Absolutely. Um, we've been so trained to think that fertility is gynecocentric. I mean, it always revolves around the woman. And one of the things that I want to thank you for is being such a strong advocate for men's health and men's fertility because we're half of the equation. And even though statistically we may fall slightly below that in terms of, of uh, on, on the problem chart, uh, still somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of fertility issues are related to uh, the sperm. Um, and it's important to recognize that because bypassing the problem isn't the only solution, and it's not always the best solution. Right, right. So, so here's the, this. I think is a very tough, tough. Um, decision point for a lot of couples dealing with, with infertility. They get a male factor diagnosis and, you know, it's like, we can fix this. We have, we have needles and we can inject a sperm right into the egg and you're done. You're fixed. You're better. We don't have to worry about it. And, and, and you know, you're not going to want to get pregnant again or multiple times or whatever. So now you have, you're, you're basically set and you can have sex and be free and whatever. Um, so why, why treat the man? And, and what goes into the decision-making process to treat, to treat men? Well, I think, number one, it's about choice. So you have to lay out options. And if there's more than one option, it's really not right as a physician to not lay out what all the options are. Because it's not my choice how someone gets treated. Mm -hmm. As you saw from, from Harley, I didn't say run in and go fix your varicose. I said, here are some of the options. You know, these are the things you need to take into account when you make a decision, and we'll do whatever you think is best for you. None of this is, is particularly life-threatening uh, in the fertility world, although rarely something is. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that there's a huge toll and burden placed on the woman if she has to be responsible for going through all the treatment. Number three is those treatments are not without side effect. Uh, and number four is the cost in general if the male has a treatable condition, it's usually more cost effective than by treating the woman with, uh, with very advanced technology. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's, those are good. Those are good points to make. So I also I just want to uh, to back up the way you phrased the question was you can put a, a sperm into the egg with a needle and fix the problem. Mm -hmm. That actually doesn't fix the problem. The problem is something underlying. Mm -hmm. What it does is it, it it alleviates the situation. Meaning, if someone wants one baby, then that may help them get that baby, but it doesn't fix the problem of their underlying fertility, right. especially if it's related to to the man. Right. Right. And and I have heard that. That some some IVF cycles will even even with ICSI can fail because the sperm are just not good. So that's the big the big question is, does it make a difference how good the sperm are? And I believe that it does. I believe that not every sperm is the same, and I believe that some sperm, just like some eggs, are good, and some sperm, like some eggs, are bad. And if you have poor sperm quality, depending on how poor, because there are different levels. Uh, that can impact the success of IVF. And once again, IVF, not a bad thing. It's just a matter of how things are applied and right. whether you give people options. Right, right. Well, I think this is a good point to, to open it up and, and, uh, and take your questions about, about, uh, about male fertility in general or testosterone hormones uh, specifically. Are there any questions out there? So we're, me and my wife are one, oh, sorry. <clears throat> me and my wife are one cycle through IVF. Um, we first started with IUI, and then that didn't work, so I went and got checked out and found out that I had a varicocil. Um, it became uh, financial with her, um, maybe some difficulties in mine that we went ahead and just did the IVF instead of fixing my varicocil. After this one round, it didn't work, so... Uh, this is how we actually found Fertility Planet and this great resource that we have now, um, looking into some integrative and other issues. Uh, looking at my life personally on down the road, I'm in my going on my later 30s. Um, at what level would you say, or what recommendations would you have to maybe see if my testosterone, because it's normal right now, um, but even though I do have a low count, low uh, motilities, how would you? Or what recommendations would you look at for my health as I go into my 40s and 50s with the varicocele? And is there any repercussions or negative effects that um, I could be delaying versus getting that fixed now? Terrific question. So first of all, you should have an evaluation for your fertility if you haven't already a comprehensive evaluation on your side of things. And it sounds like you probably have. In terms of, of the testosterone, uh, it would be worthwhile for you to um, see somebody should you become symptomatic and notice a difference in how you feel. It might not be a bad idea to measure your testosterone once every couple of years um, if you go and see your, your family uh, physician just to, to keep an eye on it since you're already uh, at, at risk for, for potentially having a problem. In terms of repairing the varicocele, I'm not a big fan of repairing varicoceles for potential problems that don't yet exist. So potentially, could it be an issue for you? Yes. It sounds like it might be an issue for your fertility. That, that I don't know. Um, but for you to sort of fix this preventatively, uh, I, I typically don't recommend that. I recommend that you kind of keep an eye on things. And if it becomes a problem, it can always be addressed in the future. That kind of brings up a, a, a kind of a follow-up question. It, it, Harley talked a lot about natural things, like lifting weights and and uh, running, doing sprints, eating well, minimizing your estrogen, there's a lot of things like that. Is that also shown, do you see that in your patients to boost fertility as well? I think so. Anything that will make you healthier can certainly help improve the quality of your reproductive cells. You know, they're part of your body. So, and, and reproductive health, it, it can be a reflection of general health. We know obesity in men can cause problems with sperm, cause problems with hormones. Um, so clearly being in shape, lifestyle habits, such as uh, smoking, clearly bad for your health, bad for sperm, mm -hmm. things like that, right. uh, smoking marijuana, um, all, all these things. All the that, fun stuff. All the fun stuff. <laughs> um, Guys, you don't get that fun. <laughs> well, you and I don't look like we're suffering, do we? No, no you, don't. you don't. I drink a lot of beer. <laughs> I couldn't tell. Does that help? Absolutely. But you 
with a lot get, of weight. I get, I get better looking when I'm drunk. So, well, here's the crazy thing about beer. My wife had a baby nine months ago, and I just recently learned that drinking beer actually helps with lactation. Really? Yeah. So maybe I'm lactating. Okay, well then somebody... <laughs> on, on that note, we might want to <laughs> end this session when I have my lactating former football friends uh, up on stage with the pregnant woman. Uh, we might want to call a timeout. We could together in a couple of weeks. Somebody oh, that, might, that, that's a party. We could, we could split a case. We could do a case race. And then see who lactates yeah, that's more. A party. <laughs> I never thought that I would have that discussion with the gladiator. Neither did I. <laughs> Neither did the gladiator. <laughs> are there other are there other questions? So I have actually another one myself. Um, Lee mentioned or. Uh, Harley mentioned very briefly about estrogen, and mm -hmm. I think this is a, th a thing that never gets talked about in men is estrogen levels, and I know that they're important. They you are. Know, men need to, they need estrogen, which surprised me when I learned it, and also that men often have high estrogen, and that can cause problems. So can you talk a little bit about that? So uh, estrogen is, uh, and testosterone are produced in men and women, just in different ratios. In women, the estrogen level is clearly much higher, hopefully, than the testosterone level. And in men, it's the reverse. And it's not only the total level of testosterone that affects how men feel and, how, uh, and sperm production, but it's the ratio of testosterone to estrogen. Uh, and that ratio we like to see is better than 10 to 1 testosterone to estrogen. There are some conditions, such as obesity, where testosterone goes down and estrogen goes up, and that causes a problem in terms of how men feel, how they're able to lose weight, and, and also, in many cases, sperm production. Mm -hmm. So one of the other ways that we address some of these issues is by lowering testosterone in men who have, or, sorry, lowering estrogen in men who might have elevated estrogen levels. Okay. So I'm not sure how common it is, but we, we do see it from time to time. I have a question for the, uh, the um, a lot of men who abuse steroids get the, 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 the breasts, mm -hmm. and that's caused by too much estrogen that is kind yes. of a byproduct of too much testosterone. Right? It's, it's a byproduct of testosterone or HCG therapy. What happens is there's an enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen called aromatase. And when men have too much testosterone by supplementing it, then some of this gets diverted into the estrogen pathway, and then the estrogen level goes up. Mm -hmm. And then they start getting signs of, of being hyperestrogenic, uh, which is breast development. Oh, I see. Uh, which is breast development and also not feeling very good and decrease erectile function. So very important about the body and, and about hormones. It's not about absolutes, it's about balance. So um, if a man is going for, um, you know, he's getting a full evaluation and he's, you, you want to like, okay, I, I think I might have an issue. What are the, what are the things that should get tested? We have a, a semen analysis and, and a, hor a hormone palindrome seems like it should be done. Yes. So uh, what, what hormones should we make sure to measure? So uh, we measure test testosterone, total testosterone and free testosterone, which is the usable component of testosterone because okay. some men have normal amounts of testosterone, but the part that is available for the body to use can be low, and that can relate to symptoms. Okay. Uh, we measure the pituitary hormones, LH and FSH. Okay. We measure estradiol uh, as a reflection of estrogens in the body. And on occasion, we'll measure prolactin when necessary, okay. uh, just to rule out tumors. Okay, are there any other major components of the kind of the fertility evaluation that a man should make sure that when he's getting evaluated, he, he's checks off the list. Absolutely. So we, we never rely on one semen analysis because they are variable. So we want to get at least two to get a, a baseline reflection of, of where somebody's at. Uh, and I think that combined with a history and a physical exam by someone who's tuned into this okay. um, is at minimum the basics. And then based on what's found on the history, on the physical, on the analysis, on the hormones, then further uh, specialized testing uh, might be done such as an ultrasound or such as DNA fragmentation levels for the sperm. Great, great. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah. So, is there, you do um, vasectomy reversals. Um, vasectomy reversals. Um, and so, sometimes my understanding is that there can be problems with that in terms of fertility. Um, such as anti-sperm antibodies. So I just wanted to know, in your practice, like, what is the procedure 
to, I mean, do you automatically test for anti-sperm antibodies or not? And I almost never test for anti-sperm antibodies. Oh. It, it's actually been shown that anti-sperm antibodies are not a huge problem uh, in couples conceiving post-vasectomy reversal. Uh, they can be a problem in some couples, but when you start looking at what the pregnancy rates are, then uh, you can see that you can't, you can't make the statement that most, because most people, most couples will get pregnant after a vasectomy reversal. So uh, there were some studies looking at whether this was a problem some years ago, and what they found is that uh, the actual vasectomy reversal itself, the way that the tubes were put back together and some scarring seemed to be a bigger problem because when you repeated a vasectomy reversal in someone who had poor sperm parameters, uh, the couples then got pregnant at much higher rates. Uh, the other issue is with testing anti-sperm antibodies. So it's pretty much been uh, established that most men who've had a vasectomy will produce antibodies to sperm as measured by antibodies in the bloodstream. The problem is antibodies in the bloodstream don't relate to fertility. So it's only antibodies on the sperm that can be tested. Uh, and that can only happen after someone's had a vasectomy reversal. So the only time I, I, I actually will even consider this is if someone has very poor quality sperm and those sperm are, are agglutinated or clumped together. That's usually a, a sign of, of antibodies. I shouldn't say usually, but it can be a sign of antibodies. And in those men, uh, it might trigger a test where we do the antibody testing specifically on a sperm. So to get back to your original question, which is do I see anti-sperm antibodies as a big problem in my post-vasectomy reversal patients? The answer is no. In a small group, yes, but for the vast majority, no. And what do you do if they do have them? So one possible solution is do nothing because they get pregnant anyway, in many cases. Uh, another possible solution is doing artificial insemination, intrauterine insemination, where you try to wash the antibodies off. And there are some lab techniques where um, we dilute uh, semen sample and, and try to prevent the antibodies uh, or minimize the antibodies from from hitting the sperm uh, because the antibodies are typically made uh, in the prostate fluid and the sperm come from the testicle and different components of the ejaculate. Um, so there are some techniques that potentially might be beneficial. Some people put, uh, put patients on steroids to reduce the immune response. I'm not sure how effective scientifically it is, um, but we use that uh, fairly commonly in men whose sperm uh, don't look so great after a reversal in, those, in, in that small percentage of men, sometimes putting them on steroids can, can actually improve the quality of their sperm. And I'm sorry, one last thing. You, sure. you mentioned the two, sometimes people or men have to do two reversals. Is that right? If, if, like, if the sperm count afterwards is really low and not looking good, then do you do another reversal? So I, I typically don't, but what I was doing is actually quoting a study where they looked at whether it is a problem with the vasectomy reversal or a problem with anti-sperm antibodies that causes post-vasectomy reversal infertility. And what they found is it was actually, in their population, a problem with, uh, with the reversal. And when they redid the reversal, the pregnancy rates went up. So redoing the reversal should do nothing to minimize their anti-sperm antibodies. Right. And that's how they came to that conclusion. So I typically very rarely do redo reversals for sperm quality. Um, on occasion, uh, I will, but uh, mostly it's because uh, the vasectomy uh, reversal had to fail to begin with it. There was no sperm after the, uh, the procedure. Thank you. Sure. Good questions. Thank you. So um, it's time to, uh, okay, one, one I'll be really quick, 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 quick one. <laughs> Uh, we did IVF, uh, and my husband had uh, done a sperm sample twice uh, beforehand, and they found that his sperm was, like, abnormally shaped, double heads. Uh, I mean, he had good sperm count other than that, uh, but what causes, like, abnormal-looking sperm in so, general. So, so that's a good question, uh, and the reason it's a good question is because it, it dovetails into something I really want to talk about, and something we, we started talking about, which is sperm quality. So one thing is the amount of sperm that's produced, which is, like your husband, normal sperm counts. He has plenty of sperm, but it seems like the quality is impaired, which is probably the reason, or, or part of the reason, and, and I can't speak to your specific situation, obviously, that you might be having a, a fertility issue to begin with. 
Um, and in those cases, you should get evaluated. There's a very, very long list of things that can cause a problem with sperm morphology. We've talked about the varicocele. Uh, there could be uh, a bunch of other things um, that uh, we don't have time to go into, but you know, my suggestion was is that uh, he, he find a good male reproductive specialist, and uh, and then uh, you can key into exactly what his problem might be and talk about uh, what potential solutions there are. For it. That actually leads into my point that um, you actually can uh, meet with Dr. Worthman after the session. And also, if you go onto the Fertility Planet website, uh, there's the ability to, to book a, a free consultation to just be able to talk to him if you have additional questions and you want to do a little bit more in-depth one-on-one, you know, to ask what's going on uh, in your particular situation. And I encourage you to do that. He's an incredibly... Brilliant doctor. You're too kind. And I, I have interviewed him several times, and I just, every time I learn something new. Um, also, you'll be able to watch all of these sessions, again, on the Fertility Planet website for free. Um, and there is an ongoing Twitter conversation with a hashtag, um, FPLA14. I'm going to thank uh, Fora.tv for the filming and I want to thank you, Dr. Worthman, for your incredible knowledge on the topic, and you, Lee Rareman, for sharing a seat with me and, and talking about lactation. <laughs> and drinking. Our case race is on in, in a couple of weeks once I get this baby out. <laughs> and I'd like to thank the Center for Male Reproductive Medicine and Vasectomy Reversal for supporting this uh, incredible dialogue on testosterone. I'd also like to thank uh, Harley Pasternak for that um, very touching raw video uh, sharing sharing his uh, experience. I just think it's very hard for men to share uh, personal journeys with this and um, so I just I really honor that and also his incredible expertise on the, on the exercise side so I just really I thank you Harley uh, for sending that video in and, and joining us and I'd like to thank you for being part of this session, and for those who are online tweeting with us, um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it.